So uh, it's my pleasure to, to kick off this award ceremony. I'm Dr. Atul Humar. I'm the head of the Toronto Transplant Institute and the training program in uh, regenerative medicine here. Um, so uh, uh, it's a real honor to today to uh, host the Idigawa Nietzsche Prize. Uh, the um, uh, Nietzschean uh, Center for Regenerative Medicine has been a close collaborator of ours for over 10 years now. Um, with the training program in regenerative medicine, which is hosted by the Toronto Transplant Institute. And uh, through this collaboration, uh, I think we've had over 60 trainees in, in India and Japan participate in the training program for regenerative medicine today, uh, to date. Um, so uh, I'm really uh, proud that all of you are able to join us here. We have Dr. Kato. Uh, from Japan and Dr. Samuel Abraham, Abraham, who's been a close colleague and collaborator of ours, uh, and Dr. Gary Levy, who uh, started the training program in regenerative medicine some 15 or more years ago, um, and uh, of course Dr. Rosenberg, who I will ask uh, Dr. Levy to introduce. So uh, with that, uh, we will get started. I welcome you all, and I'll ask Dr. Levy to come and introduce Dr. Rosenberg, please. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Humar, um, and it's an extreme pleasure to be here today um, as the chair of the selection committee uh, for the Edegawa Nietzsche Prize. Um, I'm extremely honored to be asked to introduce this year's recipient, uh, Professor uh, Stephen Rosenberg, for his groundbreaking work on T-cell immunotherapy and cancer. I also want to take this opportunity uh, to thank uh, Dr. Samuel Abraham for his leadership uh, in the establishment of the Nietzschean Regenerative Medicine Institute, which uh, we have partnered with, as Dr. Humar stated, for over 15 years and was established to promote basic research and clinical application in the field of regenerative medicine. In 2015, uh, the Nietzschean Regenerative Medicine Institute in the Etagawa Hospital, under the direction of Dr. Cato and his family, entered into a formal partnership. And in 2017, I was honored to participate in their first meeting held in Tokyo, Japan. At that time, the chairman of the Etagawa Hospital, Dr. Masahiro Cato, announced the establishment of the Etagawa Nietzsche Prize. Uh, to be awarded to a physician and or scientist from around the world chosen by the Edegawa Nietzsche Prize Committee, which is shown here on this slide, which I've been asked uh, to chair, and it's based on the contribution to the development of healthcare solutions that lead to prevention, diagnosis, or treatment of any disease, which is the result of an interdisciplinary interaction among different fields of science. Last year, the Edegawa Prize was awarded to Dr. James Till, Professor Emeritus at the University of Toronto for his groundbreaking discovery of stem cells, which has had broad applicability. This year, we're pleased to present this prize to Dr. Stephen Rosenberg. Just a few words, because I don't want to cut into his time. Dr. Rosenberg was born in New York, the Bronx formerly, but we'll say New York, in the United States and received a Bachelor of Science in 1960, a medical degree in 1963 at Johns Hopkins University. He then completed a residency at the Peter Bent Brigham Hospital in 1974, where he earned a PhD in biophysics from Harvard University. Following completion of his surgical residency, he became chief of surgery at the National Cancer Institute, a position he continues to hold. He conducted his groundbreaking work on the development and use of interleukin-2 and immune cells for the treatment of patients with cancer and specifically melanoma. And I was fortunate to meet him many years ago uh, and excited by this work. He then went on to show that expanding immune cells known as tumor infiltrating lymphocytes or TILs can be used to treat patients with a broad array of cancer. In 2002, he published in the prestigious journal Science that even patients with advanced melanoma can be put in remission using a combination of chemotherapy and immune cells and high-dose interleukin-2. 
In 2006, he went on to demonstrate that the receptor of T cells can be transferred uh, to immune cells and used for treatment of patients with cancer, which has now led to the development of chimeric antigen receptor T cell immunotherapy, or CAR T cells. What's most remarkable about this gentleman is that he continues today to run an unbelievably highly productive research laboratory and conduct groundbreaking basic and clinical research. His work has had huge application in the field of cancer and furthermore in the treatment of autoimmune disease and even tolerance induction, which we have a broad interest in. Dr. Rosenberg has received many honors for his groundbreaking discoveries including the Golden Plate Award of the American Academy of Achievement in 1992, the William Coley Award for Distinguished Research in Tumor Immunology of the Cancer uh, Research Institute in 2011, the KO Medical Science Prize in 2013, and the Medal of Honor of the American Cancer Society in 2015, and that is not all. Please welcome Dr. Stephen Rosenberg. Thank you. Well, thank you for those very kind remarks. And in fact, it is indeed a great honor for me to receive this uh, Edegawa Nietzsche uh, Prize, and I thank you. Uh, I thank you uh, for that. I'm sorry I couldn't actually come to Japan. My schedule didn't allow me to take that uh, trip away from uh, away from my laboratory and, uh, and patients. And I'm delighted that I have a chance, at least, to uh, present uh, to accept this award. Uh, and especially proud and uh, happy to understand that there are many young students who are going to be at this uh, meeting that will get to uh, that will get to hear this. So my thanks, not only for your kind comments, but for the uh, foundation that awarded this uh, this prize. And it's a remarkable honor to join Dr. Till uh, in receiving this award. What I'd like to do in the next ten minutes or so <coughs> is provide a very brief summary uh, of the work that I've been doing for the last three decades or so, uh, trying to develop new immunotherapies for the treatment of patients with cancer. As you know, we have surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy, three modalities that are commonly used in treating cancer patients, and they can, in fact, cure a little over half of patients that develop cancer in the year 2019. But the half of patients that cannot be cured uh, in the United States, for example, resulted in 600,000 deaths, one out of every three to four people now alive, and most countries will die of uh, cancer unless we find better treatments to join surgery, radi radi uh, radiation therapy, and chemotherapy. And so for over three decades, I've been working on attempts to develop what's called immunotherapy, and that is an attempt to take advantage of the body's own natural immune defenses to fight the disease. The body recognizes a cancer as foreign, uh, but not foreign enough to reject it. And I was quite taken early in my residency training in surgery when I saw a patient come into an emergency ward complaining of right upper quadrant pain. Uh, it was a typical gallbladder attack. And when I was in the emergency ward and flipping through his chart, I saw that 12 years earlier he had come to this hospital with a stomach cancer that had spread to his, uh, that had spread to his uh, liver. He was opened by the surgeons. They biopsied the liver metastases. They showed that it was, uh, it was in fact a metastatic cancer. They closed his abdomen, sent him home, never expecting to see him again. But as I flipped through the chart, I saw year after year he kept returning. And here he was 12 years later. Uh, with what appeared to be a gallbladder attack. One of the first operations I did as a young surgeon, uh, we removed his gallbladder, examined his belly, his cancer had disappeared. Somehow, he had undergone what's one of the most rare of events in medicine, and that is a spontaneous regression of a cancer in the absence of any therapy. And it was this observation that somehow the body had the wisdom to attack the cancer, it was only the fourth report of this ever in the medical literature, and completely destroy it. And it seemed that it was the immune system 
that had the power to do this. And that led me, when I came to the National Cancer Institute as the chief of the surgery branch, to devote my efforts to developing ways to treat the immune system to treat cancer. And our first attempts would non-specifically stimulate the body's uh, immune system by treating patients with interleukin-2, a hormone produced by lymphocytes in the body that is a non-specific stimulant of the immune system. And in performing this work, we started working with uh, natural mammalian IL-2 that we would produce in the laboratory. Uh, we started adding that with a kind of cell called a lymphokine-activated killer cell that was produced with the interleukin-2. Uh, we then started giving high doses of recombinant interleukin-2 to patients, and you could see we treated 66 patients uh, and published this uh, work. We didn't see a single response in any one of the first 66 patients. It was only when we moved to very high-dose bolus interleukin-2 given every eight hours based on the pharmacokinetics of what it would take. The half-life of interleukin-2 is only about seven or eight minutes in vivo, and so it has to be given repeatedly. And it was only in November of 1984 that we treated the first patient with high-dose interleukin-2 uh, with a regimen that we had, uh, that we had developed. Uh, and uh, it was this patient. Uh, Linda, who had had a melanoma, it had spread, she had received alpha interferon, uh, hadn't worked, she was told to go to Europe and travel around, she only had a short time to live, but she was the first patient that we uh, treated with high dose interleukin-2 uh, with this schedule. She underwent a complete regression of widespread metastatic disease and remains free of disease now over 35 later, uh, years, uh, years later. Uh, and she gained some quite renowned at that time. This was the first time that an immune stimulus had resulted in the disappearance of widespread metastatic cancer. And in fact, it was the ongoing developments of interleukin-2 that led to uh, the first U.S. Food and Drug Administration approval of an immunotherapy for the treatment of cancer and renal cancer in 1992 and melanoma in 1998. Well, we knew that this could work, and imagine how thrilling it was to see these first patients back in the 1980s have regressions of metastatic disease. You see here in this, uh, this uh, x-ray uh, on your left, all those fluffy white areas are areas of the lung that are being replaced by cancer. This patient underwent a complete, complete the regression of her metastatic disease, and we saw this at all organs of the body, including the bone uh, and the liver. At about a rate of 15 to 20 percent of patients would have objective regressions. You could see uh, on the left uh, this large liver metastatic deposit. There were multiple in the body, disappeared completely, uh, and this patient, again, is completely disease-free uh, disease now. Uh, well over 20 years later, so it could work. That led us to start looking at how it could work. And it was clear that there would be T lymphocytes that would be the immune warriors of the uh, immune system that circulate in the body, a million of them in every thimbleful milliliter of blood that are patrolling the body for foreign uh, invaders. And that led us to begin studying these lymphocytes. And we took this work in two directions. We see here the war that's ongoing inside the body when we do immunotherapy. You see these lymphocytes here in white attaching to tumor cells. They can introduce uh, perforin into these cells and kill them. Uh, they can produce cytokines that bring other uh, immune cells uh, to this uh, battle to try to uh, eliminate the cancer. So we went in these two directions. And one of these was a collaboration uh, that I had with French Anderson, uh, Mike Blaze, uh, that are in this, uh, in this photo. We wanted to try to increase the activity of the natural cells, to not be limited only by the natural cells in the body, but because we now had means to genetically modify these cells, could we modify them in ways to improve their anti-tumor activity. Now this is ne had never been allowed uh, by the FDA or any regulatory group. They considered genetic modification of cells uh, to be too uh, dangerous. In fact, there were lawsuits about the NIH not being allowed to uh, do it. It took about a year to solve that after we wanted to get started, and we finally began our first trial. 
And in fact, 2019 is exactly the 30th year after we received permission from the FDA to treat patients with gene modified cells. It's uh, a few months after the 30th anniversary uh, of the first uh, patient was treated, and we published it a year later in the New England Journal of Medicine. And that, in a sense, opened the ability to now genetically modify cells to improve their anti-tumor activity. Uh, and to jump many years later, as we began to develop this, we developed an approach in which we could take lymphocytes from patients with lymphomas and leukemias, genetically modify them to target a molecule called CD19 on these lymphomas. And we use these genetically modified cells for the first time ever to treat a patient with a leukemia, uh, a lymphoma, a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and you see his typical story here. He was diagnosed in 2002. He received a combination chemotherapy, didn't work, received a vaccine, received a checkpoint modulator, then received another aggressive chemotherapy. And by this time, he had pounds of tumor in his uh, belly and his abdomen. I'll show you the x-rays. He was the first patient ever treated with CAR T cells, underwent a complete regression, now ongoing 10 years, uh, 10 years later. And you see his x-rays on the left with the yellow arrows pointing to tumors in his, uh, his axilla, his armpit. You can see the large mediastinal mass in this second x-ray from the top. Uh, those are the pretreatment x-rays. The post-treatment x-rays are on the right. You can see the enormous spleen in the next, uh, in the next uh, CAT scan cut, as well as lymph nodes surrounding his aorta and vena cava and large iliac lymph nodes in the bottom. All of his disease disappeared. Uh, and he's remained, again, disease-free since that time. Well, a few years after we reported this first case and had treated other patients, one of my former fellows, Ari Belligran, came to see me, wanted to start a company. I'm at the National Institutes of Health. I'm not allowed to be involved with those, but we helped him uh, get started. Uh, and he founded a company in 2012 by then, in the surgery branch, our objective response rate in patients with the most aggressive of the lymphomas, the diffuse large B-cell lymphomas, we could cause durable, complete regressions in about half of all of these patients. Kite Pharma then signed a cooperative research agreement with our lab at the National Cancer Institute in 2012. And five short years later, Kite Pharma uh, had their treatment approved by the FDA uh, in, uh, in 2017. Uh, and that same month, in October 2017, Kite Pharma was sold to Gilead Sciences for $11.9 billion, uh, a company that had the capability of now bringing this treatment uh, to the world at large. And that's how science works. Basic research laboratories, translational research laboratories develop findings, uh, and then industry is involved in bringing them to people, uh, to people in, uh, in need. Well, more recently, we've not, been, we've not only been dealing with cells that you can genetically modify, but with the very natural cells that exist in the body. And we've reported in the last uh, three to four years uh, the finding that, in fact, virtually 80% or more of all patients who develop the common epithelial cancers, and you see them listed here, these are 99 consecutive cases, colorectal cancer, bile duct cancer, pancreas, throughout the GI tract, breast cancer, ovarian cancer, and so on. If we look to see if, in fact, we can find T cells that can recognize the tumor naturally, we might be able to use those natural cells for therapy as well, and they're called tumor-infiltrating lymphocytes. The tumor is a sink for cells with anti-tumor activity. These cells are continually patrolling the body. When they find their antigen, they stop, they become activated, they divide into large numbers, and we call that an immune system, an immune reaction. And you can see a vitally important finding here that I, uh, that I wanted to emphasize, uh, especially to the young students interested in developing this kind of treatment, in that in 80% of patients with the common epithelial cancers that result in 90% of all cancer deaths around the world, we can find T cells that recognize antigens present on the cancer. And in fact, in the 99 consecutive patients that we've studied, there are more now, we could identify a total of 197 different molecules that gave rise to these immunes, this immune system. And of these 197 immunogenic molecules, 
196 were absolutely unique to the patient uh, who developed the cancer. And these T cells are actually recognizing the products of the mutations that caused the cancer. There are only two patients that shared the same antigen reactivity, a uh, G12D KRAS antigen restricted by CW0802, a class one uh, MHC uh, antigen. And so we're now working to see if we can isolate these very rare cells. These are very often one in 100,000 of the cells that are uh, uh, circulating minimum of one in a thousand within the tumor itself, so sophisticated techniques have to be used to identify and isolate them. But when you do that, you now can in some patients, in about 15% of patients with these common epithelial cancers, mediate durable regressions of, uh, of cancer. And this is the first patient that this was ever done in a uh, woman, Melinda, 45 years old, typical history of a cholangiocarcinoma, a bile duct cancer. She had half of her, uh, half of her uh, liver removed. Uh, she developed multiple lung and liver metastases. Uh, she received uh, chemotherapy, progressed, more chemotherapy, progressed. Uh, you can't just grow till the way you do in melanoma patients. You have to absolutely select them. And we gave her unselected till. There was no response, but we could identify cultures that had 90% reactivity against unique mutation, an herb B2IP mutation in her tumor. We gave her that uh, treatment. She had multiple lung uh, and liver metastases, and these disappeared, and she's living normally now uh, five, years, uh, five years later. Somewhat ironic that the targets of the immune system that can cause regression are the products of the very genes that cause the cancer itself. Cancer antigens are the products of mutations that uh, have caused the cancer. And so this is not individual cancer type specific. It's potentially a treatment for any cancer type since all cancers have mutations. And we're working day and night now to uh, try to develop this. This is a patient we just published last year with a breast cancer. You can see a typical history of a patient who had a primary cancer removed, uh, developed uh, metastatic disease to a chest wall, bone, lymph nodes. You can see what happens with uh, patients with cancer. They move from one treatment to another. Once you have metastatic disease, virtually nobody is cured by any uh, systemic uh, chemotherapy or targeted therapy. She went through a variety of these agents, including uh, hormonal treatments, uh, progressed through all of them. We then treated her with uh, her uh, own T cells, and you can see the results of that here, this lesion on her, in her chest on the left, growing through the chest wall, multiple liver metastases that have dif disappeared completely, uh, and she remains disease-free a little over three years later. And finally, a patient with a cervical cancer who had a tumor that was uh, from her cervix. It was invading into her vagina. She had lung and intraperitoneal metastases, underwent radiation therapy, uh, chemotherapy, uh, developed an obstructed ureter. Uh, she received her own cells that was specifically selected to target the mutations that caused her cancer. And again, you can see the yellow arrows on the left, lymph nodes on the top that disappeared, a chest wall mass on the top, another lymph node, uh, second from the bottom, and you can see the lymph node that was obstructing her ureter, and that square in white is their uh, ureteral catheter that was necessary uh, to prevent her ureteral obstruction, and all of her tumor disappeared. We could take out the catheter, and again, she's, remaining, uh, she's living normally now four years later. So it only happens now about 15% of the time, but we at least have a blueprint that can be used to treat uh, patients with the common cancers that are such uh, significant uh, killers. Well, I've in the course of just 10 or 15 minutes taken you through well over 30 years of, uh, of research in an attempt especially to emphasize to uh, the younger scientists and physicians in the, uh, in the audience that based on clinical observations, that one patient we saw that had that spontaneous regression, you can buy paying attention to your patients and to serendipitous findings in the laboratory, uh, develop clues that can lead you to uh, substantial, uh, substantial findings. So I wish uh, all of the young people hearing this uh, the, best of, uh, the best of wishes. And once again, I want to thank the uh, Etagawa uh, Nietzsche group for 
providing me with this very prestigious award. Thank you very much. So, <laughs> Professor Rosenberg, first of all, congratulations on your exciting work and success. We're extremely proud to have you here today. And on behalf of the selection committee and the patrons of the Edegawa Nietzsche uh, Committee, please accept this medal. Well, it's a token. Uh, and at the same time, this plaque, which we hope you will hang in your office uh, in recognition of your outstanding contribution well, to the surely, field of medicine. I surely will be proud to, to, to have this available and let people know about this uh, very prestigious prize. Thank you so much. And maybe we could get some of the other members up here and the committee and uh, so forth. Very good afternoon, everybody. And congratulations, Dr. Rosenberg, on this award. On behalf of the Edagova Nish Prize Committee, the patrons, Dr. Masahiro Keto, who is the chairman of the Edagova Hospital, Professor Masatoshi Koshiba, who is a Nobel laureate in physics in 2002, and my fellow executive member of the committee, Dr. Shojiro Kato, who has come all the way from Japan to join us here. I take this opportunity to first thank you, thank every one of you, especially Dr. Rosenberg, because he having accepted this prize, this prize is honored. And the work that he has accomplished has heralded the birth of a new chapter in the fight against cancer. It's a great hope to people, a wonderful contribution to the society. Thank you, sir. And Professor Gary Levy, as the chair of the awards committee, having been guiding us for the past two years, especially this year, right from the process of selection and the interactions and until arriving at this day. Professor Humer, his team has been kind enough to make us use this facility and their offices for this video recording as well as award ceremony. Ms. Anna Coco, coordinator of the training program of regenerative medicine, and Ms. Carrie Rossiter, Secretary of Thank Professor you. Rosenberg. Sure. Well, thank you. They have been planning very meticulously, minute by minute, what should be done, and all the documentation work, they did it very well. Thank you both very much. It is Mr. Matt Proctor, Ms. Johnson Michael, Ms. Kimberly Thong, who gave their technical assistance in video recording this event. And it will be remembered forever. And finally, and the most importantly, the associates, faculty, and all the sponsoring and supporting agencies of the training program in regenerative medicine, who are a great source of learning for us. And our partnership with them since 2008 with the NCR and the Nichi Center for Regenerative Medicine that inspired us that we should portray role models like Professor Till and Professor Rosenberg to the youngsters so that they will take up research with an attitude of accepting interdisciplinary interaction is not an option, but it is a necessity. Thank you very much. Thank you, every one of you.